I have a basic CloudStack zone here with two KVM hosts in one cluster. Let's go ahead and add zone-wide primary storage to this environment. I'll click on the View All button of Primary Storage. In the upper right, I'll click on the Add Primary Storage button. I'll select Zone-wide for the scope. For the hypervisor, I'm going to select any. Now even if we just have one hypervisor type, such as in this situation where I just have KVM, we still want to select any for the hypervisor. I'll then go ahead and enter a name. Let's go with Solid Fire Cluster A. For protocol, I'll select Custom. From the provider area, this is our list of installed storage plugins. The selected one is the default, the one that is uh, embedded in CloudStack by default. The other ones may or may not come with CloudStack. Some do, some don't. The one that I'm going to select, the SolidFire primary storage, does come pre-installed with CloudStack. I'll go ahead and drop this box down, select SolidFire. Now this is storage that's known as managed storage in CloudStack uh, terminology. We can check the managed checkbox for this particular type of primary storage. Now as it actually turns out, for adding this particular type of primary storage, we don't technically need to check this box. It is going to be managed storage by default. For bytes, we want to specify how many bytes from this particular SAN CloudStack is able to use with this particular primary storage. Now, since this is in bytes and not something like gigabytes, it ends up typically being a really large number. And I actually have this in a, in a document here. Let me go ahead and find it. Uh, I wanted to provide two petabytes worth of storage. So I'll just go ahead and copy that and paste it in here. So we can make volumes until we hit this capacity limitation or until we hit our performance limitation, which I'm going to say that we can use 4.5 million IOPS from this particular SAN. Now the URL field in this case is a collection of key value pairs which I also have in this document, which I'll go back to, and I'll go ahead and select it here and copy it. And in a moment, I'll come back and explain what all of these fields mean. I'll go ahead and paste that in. And then just to finish off this particular dialog, let me add a storage tag. So I'm going to use something, let's go with SolidFire Cluster 1. So now we've filled in everything the way we need to. I'll go ahead and click on the OK button. And in just a moment, we'll have our zone-wide primary storage based on a solid fire cluster added to this particular zone in our CloudStack cloud. Now let me switch back to that text document and explain some of these fields that we added to the URL, to the URL field while creating that primary storage. The first one that I'm highlighting is the MVIP, the Management Virtual IP Address. This is the IP address that the plugin talks to the SAN for control operations like creating a volume, deleting a volume, creating an account, operations like that. And then we have a semicolon to separate our key value pairs. Our next one is the SVIP, the storage virtual IP address. And this is what our KVM hosts will use when they talk iSCSI with our SolidFire volumes. I'll highlight the next key value pair. This is a cluster admin, which we have already created on the SolidFire cluster. So if I switch over to my web browser and go over to the SolidFire GUI. I can go over to Cluster Admin and we can see here, I'll go ahead and highlight the name. I already have a user with the name Admin who has privileges to do everything that needs to be done 
uh, from CloudStack, such as creating volumes, accounts, those kinds of operations. So if we switch back to our text document, I can see that that is the cluster admin name that I'd like to use. The next key value pair is the password. So in this case, the user named admin, his password is also admin. And then there's a few fields that finish off this uh, URL concept. The first one here, which I'll go ahead and highlight, is a minimum number of IOPS to provide for volumes that are created where neither the user nor the admin has actually specified the minimum IOPS. So usually an administrator will provide a minimum and a maximum number of IOPS in a compute offering and or a disk offering, but the, the admin can actually choose to not place any values in those fields. This is where the minimum default comes from. And then likewise, I'll go ahead and select it. This is where the maximum default comes from. If you configure your compute offering or your disk offering in such a way as to actually push these performance characteristics onto your end user, allowing him or her to enter in the minimum or the maximum number of IOPS, if they decide to leave those fields blank, this is also where those defaults come from. The next value here, which I'm highlighting, is the multiplier that we use to arrive at our number of burst IOPS. So SolidFire provides a minimum, maximum, and a burst number of IOPS per volume. The burst is calculated by taking the maximum and multiplying it, in this case, by the number 1.5. Now that we have our primary storage, let's go back into our infrastructure view and click on View All for Zones. And go ahead under the Quick View option, let's go ahead and enable this zone. I'll click on the Yes button. And then we'll check back in in just a moment once the system VMs are up and running. Our system VMs are now up and running. In this case, that's the console proxy VM and the secondary storage VM. I'll switch over to the SolidFire GUI over to the Accounts tab and explain some of the interactions that happened on the SolidFire cluster as a result of us spinning up those two system VMs on the SolidFire cluster. So, for one, we have in the SolidFire system, an account concept similar to what exists on the CloudStack side. So when CloudStack went ahead and issued commands to the underlying storage plugin, in this case the SolidFire storage plugin, to create vol volumes, it did so under a system account for CloudStack. Now the SolidFire storage plugin realized that there was not an equivalent SolidFire account on the SolidFire SAN for that particular CloudStack account, so it went ahead and created one. And we can see the name here. I'll go ahead and highlight it. These start with the word CloudStack, then an underscore. Then they have the UUID of the CloudStack account, followed by an underscore, and then this final number is the ID of that row in the account table. In this case, we have three SolidFire volumes that were created as a result of these two system VMs being spun up. Let's go take a look at these in more detail on the Volumes tab. And we can see here, I'll highlight the first one, the first one is called Routing-3. This is the name of the template that both of these VMs made use of. So what first happened was we realized that this template that we were copying down from secondary storage to primary storage had not yet been copied to primary storage before, so we went ahead and copied it onto a solid fire volume. 
Then we went ahead and cloned this solid fire volume twice, once for the root disk of each system VM. And then those VMs were started and uh, got to their current state of, of being in the running state with the uh, agent software on each of them interacting with the CloudStack cloud. So we can see here the size of this template is 4 gigabytes. Therefore, you would expect that the size of each of these cloned volumes is also 4 gigabytes. If we look over at the Quality of Service tab, this is where we see a little bit of a difference between the initial template volume and the two volumes that were cloned from it. The template volume, by default, was given a minimum number of 4K IOPS at 100, and then a very high number of max IOPS. And then if we can remember back to when we added primary storage that was based on the SolidFire plugin, to get the burst IOPS, we took the max IOPS multiplied by a value of 1.5, and so that's how we get our 30,000 burst IOPS. What this will lead to is at least some minimum level of performance when copying that volume from secondary storage to primary storage, but if the resources are available on the SAN, which in my case uh, they, they were since I don't have this SAN very heavily utilized, we can go up to 20,000 4K IOPS, which uh, led to the volume or the template being copied from secondary storage to primary storage very quickly. So once that process was accomplished, we then went ahead and cloned the volume twice. And we can see here we have a different number of IOPS for minimum, maximum, and burst for root-22 and root-21. They have the same, but those are different from routing-3. And the reason root-22 and root-21 are at 1,000, 2,000 and 3,000 IOPS respectively going from min, max to burst is that I did spin them up from a system offering where I did not actually specify a minimum or a maximum number of IOPS and therefore we drew those defaults from the defaults that we provided when we added primary storage to CloudStack that was based on the SolidFire plugin. We at that point said if we don't specify a minimum number of IOPS, use 1,000. If we don't specify a maximum, use 2,000, and then calculate burst by taking max times 1.5. And so that's why these two rows have the same number of min, max, burst IOPS respectively, and they differ from that of the top row, which is the volume that's serving as our template volume, and those template volumes always get set up at a minimum of 100 IOPS, maximum of 20,000, and then burst being max times, in this case, 1.5. We'll revisit some of these concepts when we get into a uh, user VM and a data disk for that user VM. But at this point, I wanted to note, and I'll go over to my um, Ubuntu system that's running my CloudStack management server for this, that there are a couple uh, caveats that I noticed when I spun up system VMs making use of managed storage. One of them occurs in the cloud.vm template table. So I've highlighted the row that represents the template that we used for these particular system VMs. And I'm going to go ahead and scroll over to the right. We're going to look for the size column. Now, on a brand new install, this size column is actually, at least in my case, was set to the value null. And that actually will lead to an error if you try to spin up system VMs because CloudStack will pass into the SolidFire driver a size of null. And the SolidFire driver will then complain that it can't create a volume with that particular size. So what needs to be done here is, if this value is null, in typically in a brand new install, 
we need to actually go in and fill out its virtual size. And in this case, I filled it out to four gigabytes. What I also noticed after doing this was, for one, I needed to actually find what the virtual size was. And to do that, I went and I located this template on secondary storage. Now, as it happens, in my particular environment here, I'm running my secondary storage, my NFS server, on the same machine as my CloudStack management server. So I went over to export secondary template TMPL13 in my case. I did a, a listing here, and I see here's my QCOW2 and its corresponding properties file containing some metadata. I went in and I did a look. So, whoops, sudo gedit. Let's type in template.properties. And I brought this up. What I did notice was there were a couple fields. I'm highlighting it here and then the one right below it. These actually had incorrect sizes. So they were actually set up by default to have the physical size rather than the virtual size. And so what I did was I changed both of these virtual sizes from this number starting with a 3 to 4 billion bytes. And uh, I made sure that was consistent in the database as we just saw. So once this information was in place, at that point I was able to go ahead and successfully spin up those system VMs based on managed storage. The reason this actually doesn't become a problem with non-managed storage in a lot of um, situations is, um, is that oftentimes for non-managed storage, you might upfront allocate a really large volume or NFS share. And even though we don't have the actual details about the virtual size, in this case, they weren't set up properly. Once we copy that template from secondary storage down to primary storage, and it typically works out that the primary storage that you've pre-allocated just happens to be plenty large to, to accommodate that system template. Once we've copied it down, the, there's software that actually goes and looks and figures out things and then reports it back to the CloudStack management server, which updates the database. Now, that process works okay for certain types of non-managed storage, but managed storage is different in the sense that we don't pre-allocate volumes, we create them dynamically. So as needed, the, the underlying storage driver is told how large to make a volume, and in, in my case, how much performance to give it. But that actually has a little bit of a shortcoming here if you set up null, in the database because then CloudStack passes in null to the storage driver and that's not a legitimate size to make the volume so there is an error that occurs at that particular time. So to make this work for managed storage we just need to make sure that those fields, that field in the database, that size field for our template in the VM template table is set up correctly and then also we want to make sure that our template.properties file is set up correctly as well. Now that our system VMs are up and running, let's go back to our CloudStack GUI and create a compute offering and a disk offering. I'll go click on the service offerings tab. In the upper right, I'll click on add compute offering. Let's provide a name, maybe solid fire compute offering one, maybe some kind of a description. Uh, in this case, I'll actually put the minimum number of IOPS and the maximum number of IOPS in my description. For number of cores, let's just do one, maybe 200 megahertz, 128 megs of RAM. That all sounds good. All right, let's scroll down, and we want to take a look at this QoS type field. I'll go ahead and click on the combo box. There's a few options here. Nothing, hypervisor rate limiting, and storage. 
I'll go ahead and click on storage, we'll see a few extra fields put in the dialog be below QoS type. Here we are. Now, custom IOPS we'll get to in a moment. First, let's fill in min IOPS, which we said at the top here in our description, we said 200. So I'll put in 200. For max IOPS, we said 400, so let's put in 400. So this is the typical way that administrators set this up. Now, if you'd like, instead of actually providing a compute offering or a disk offering with pre-set up IOPS, you can actually click on the custom IOPS checkbox, and then when a user goes to spin up a VM based on this particular type of compute offering, he or she will be provided with the options min IOPS and max IOPS. And if they don't fill those in, those values again, they come from defaults that we provided when we added our primary storage to our zone. Now in this case, since I did specify specific min and max in the description, I'm going to go ahead and uncheck custom IOPS and leave min at 200, max at 400. Now we uh, can fill in other options if we want to. Uh, one thing here, now I only have one primary storage in my entire environment, but if I'd like to I can go ahead and provide a storage tag as well. At this point I'm, I'm all set. I can just go ahead and hit the OK button and this particular compute offering will be created in just a second. Now let's go and spin a VM up that makes use of this particular compute offering. So up in the Instances tab, I'm going to go ahead, upper right, click on Add Instance based on a template. I only have the 1K VM template. Let's go ahead and select my particular compute offering and so we can see with our description uh, what I expect to see from a performance standpoint. I'll click on Next. We won't worry about disk offerings at this point. If we did have a disk offering that we'd like to use, we could use it here. But I'm going to go ahead and say uh, no thanks here and just go click on the Next button. I'm not going to worry about affinity or network settings. Then in the review, I'm going to put in a name, let's go with VM-1, and click on Launch VM. So what we should expect to see here, I'm going to go over to the SolidFire GUI. We should expect, over in the Accounts tab for one, now we have three active volumes. Our system template, and then the two cloned volumes from it. In a moment, we should see, and perhaps if I go over to reporting running tasks, we do see the virtual router, our third system VM, is going to make use of that same template, routing-3. So the cloning process is already complete. So if we switch over to the volumes tab, we can see here, and I'll go ahead and highlight its name, root-24 is the solid fire volume that is backing the virtual disk, that's our root disk for our virtual router. Right here we can see that this is not yet in a volume access group. It will be in a moment. Let me click on the refresh button. And there we are. So we can see here our template is not in a volume access group. Our three root disks are in a volume access group. Now what is a volume access group? It's basically a construct that maps the volumes on the SAN to the iSCSI initiators that have permission to access those volumes. So if I switch over to the Volume Access Groups tab, we can see here I have a volume access group which was created automatically by the Solid Fire Storage plugin, and I'll go ahead and highlight the name. This these by default, they have the name CloudStack, then a dash, then the UUID of the, of the cluster that they are for. So in this case, I just have a single KVM cluster. 
and I'll go ahead and highlight this UUID. That's the UUID for my one and only KVM cluster in this particular cloud. So this volume access group, for every cluster we have in our cloud stack environment that makes use of storage from this SolidFire storage plugin, we will see a corresponding volume access group. We will see how many initiators. So these are the hosts, the IQNs of the hosts are contained within this volume access group. We can see that there's two of them in this particular case because I have two KVM hosts in this, in this cluster. And if we look at active volumes, this is how many volumes are visible to those two iSCSI initiators. So that makes sense. We have a secondary storage virtual machine, a console proxy virtual machine, a virtual router. So we have three root disks, each backed by their own solid fire volume. So at this point, we'd expect to see three active volumes. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the active volumes tab. And we can see here, so another volume has appeared. Now this is the template for our user VM that we spun up. We realized that we did not have this template on the SolidFire cluster, so we went ahead and we're in the process of, I'm not exactly sure where we are in this process, we might be completed with copying this down. Let me hit the refresh button. We might be in the cloning state. Let me switch over to running tasks. Yes. Okay, so now I know where we're at in the volumes tab. So we went ahead, we created this particular solid fire volume. We temporarily put it in a volume access group. Now it's no longer in that volume access group, but while we needed it to be copying data from secondary storage to primary storage, it needed to be in that volume access group. Once the process of performing that copy was completed, we took it out of the volume access group, which is what we see here with just that dash. And then we began the process of cloning this particular volume that stores our template into another volume, which will be used as the root disk of our user VM. So let's hit the refresh button and see where we're at. Okay, so we can see here, we've got a new volume that I've highlighted. That one was cloned from the volume I'm highlighting here. It is not yet in a volume access group. It should be momentarily. Let's hit the refresh button. Now that will happen soon enough. In the meanwhile, let me point out, now this here says account ID 84. It doesn't actually have a name such as the one I'm highlighting until you go over for the first time and, and see that particular account on the accounts tab. Now the SolidFire GUI is aware of the actual name of account 84. So if you go back to the volumes tab, you'll actually see that it's now been filled in. So what happened there was the user VM was spun up from a different CloudStack account. And we did not yet have a corresponding SolidFire account on the SolidFire cluster. So the SolidFire storage plugin went ahead and created it. And so now we can see here that root-23 is in that different SolidFire account because on the CloudStack environment, it is in a different CloudStack account than all of those previous disks that we had. And we can also see here the process of putting it in a volume access group has completed. So uh, since again, I only have the one cluster in my CloudStack environment, we should expect that all of the volumes in this case are in the same volume access group. And just kind of as a quick check, we can see they do all end in A436. And if we switch over to the volume access groups area, we can see I just actually have the one volume access group ending in A436. It does have four active volumes. And then as we noted before, it has two initiators, one for each of our KVM hosts. Now let's quickly shift back to the CloudStack GUI. 
we can see that our VM is up and running. If I click on the Instances button to refresh the GUI, we'll see the IP address fills in. So this all looks really good. If I click on my virtual machine, go to View Volumes, click on the name of that volume, we can see here all of the information we're accustomed to, including min IOPS being set at 200 and max being set at 400. Now to confirm this, let's go back to the SolidFire GUI and the Active Volumes tab and the Quality of Service sub-tab. And we can see here for Route 23, we do in fact have 200 min IOPS, 400 max IOPS, and then using our multiplier of 1.5, we arrive at 600 burst IOPS. So that all looks really good. If we look at the volume overview, we can see that the size of our disk is 8.6 gigabytes. Now let's switch back to our CloudStack GUI, scroll down to the bottom, Service Offerings, go over to our Disk Offerings, and click on Add Disk Offering. Scroll down a bit, I'll say SolidFire Disk Offering 1, and let's do something similar where I say the, the minimum and the maximum IOPS, in this case maybe let's say one, uh, maybe let's say 1500, and perhaps uh, 5,000. Great. The size of the disk, let's go with 200 gigabytes. Again, for quality of service type, we'll drop this combo box down, select storage, we'll see some extra fields appear. We have the same concept here with custom IOPS where we can check the box and pass these selections on to our end user when he or she wants to create a volume based on a disk offering, or more commonly, we'll leave that unchecked, and as the administrator, we'll fill these values in. 1,500, oops, 5,000. Since I only have the one primary storage, again, I don't really need to fill in a storage tag, but let's just go ahead and select the storage tag of my primary storage. We are now complete here, and I'll hit the OK button. In a moment, we'll have our disk offering. There it is. Let's go over to the Storage tab. Upper right, Add Volume. Let's provide a name, maybe Vol-1. Drop down our list of, list of disk offerings. So we're looking at our catalog of disk offerings. I'll select the one that we just created and hit the OK button. In a moment, this will be added to our Volumes table in the Cloud Database. To actually make the interactions with the SolidFire system to create a volume, we first have to attach this volume to a VM. So I'm going to go ahead, click Attach Disk. I only have one VM. I'll go ahead and hit the OK button. And then I'll switch over to the SolidFire GUI. And in a moment, we'll see that we have another SolidFire volume with the expected size and quality of service characteristics. Let me hit the refresh button. So here we are. And the SolidFire volumes are named after their corresponding CloudStack volumes. Solid, the, the name of SolidFire volumes does not have to be unique in a, in a SolidFire cluster. The important piece of unique information is over here, the volume ID. So this being named after the CloudStack volume is just uh, ideal for you to be able to kind of map from one system to the other. If I go look at the size here, we can see 200 gigabytes. So here um, in CloudStack, we specify this as 200 uh, GB gigabytes, but it really was actually interpreted by CloudStack as Gibby bytes. So if you ever see a dis like a difference between the one system and the other, it's just this concept of base 2 versus base 10. So in this case, this size is correct based on what we specified from CloudStack. If I go over to the Quality of Service tab, we can see that we do have our 1500 minimum IOPS, 5000 maximum, 
and then 7500 again is just the max times in this case 1.5 so we arrive at uh, 7500 IOPS if we go over to CloudStack we can see that this has been successfully attached to our VM let's say I'd now like to create a volume snapshot from one of my volumes now if you go over to the quick view column what we're going to see is we don't actually have this option what we need to do first is go over to global settings and I'm going to type in kvm dot and we can see there's this option kvm dot snapshot dot enabled by default it's false I'm going to need to go ahead and change this for my environment to be true. So close that off. And now we need to go ahead and reboot the CloudStack management server. I'll go ahead and do that and be back in a moment. Okay, so my CloudStack management server has been rebooted. I've logged back into the CloudStack GUI, back on the storage tab. Let's go ahead and create a volume snapshot of root-23 in the quick view column. I'll select take snapshot and hit the OK button. Now what's going to happen here is we're actually going to take a snapshot of the solid fire volume that is backing root-23. So this process will be quite quick. There we are. We've already taken our snapshot. If I go over to the solid fire GUI, we can see here, I'll highlight it, root-23. This particular solid fire volume, now I haven't refreshed the screen yet. If we look over here, and I'll go ahead and highlight it, it does not have any snapshots according to the non-refreshed view. When I click on this, we'll see that we do have a snapshot now for this particular solid fire volume. And if we go over to the snapshots uh, tab here, we can see that in all of my system here I just have a single solid fire snapshot. Now if I switch back to the CloudStack GUI, go over to the snapshots view, we can see we have our snapshot. It will be listed in the backed up state. Let's go ahead and in the quick view column let's create a volume based on this particular snapshot. I'll give it a name maybe vol two and I'll hit the OK button. I'll switch over to the solid fire GUI under reporting just to show this in running tasks. In a moment we'll see that we begin the process here of cloning our snapshot into a new solid fire volume. So once this process has completed then we'll have access to another volume in our CloudStack environment that is that was created from the snapshot we took of root dash, I think it was root dash 23. Yes. So in a moment, this process will be completed and we'll be able to do with our new volume the things we can do with regular CloudStack data disks. And uh, as an example, I'll go ahead and attach it to our virtual machine. So let's check on our progress here. Looks like our cloning has almost completed. And once this is done, we'll see over in the Volumes tab that we have a brand new volume with the name Vol-2. So let's switch over here. And it will not be uh, visible at this time because it hasn't been cloned yet. But once it is visible, we'll see that it's in the proper account and it is not in a volume access group because none of our KVM hosts actually have access to it because no VM in that cluster is actually attached to that particular volume. Let's hit the refresh button, see if the process has completed. It looks like it has. And we can see here this account, for example, matches this account and this account. Those are all in the uh, expected account. We do not have vol-2 in a volume access group yet, but let's go ahead and attach this particular volume to a VM, and then we'll see that that particular vol-2 will be put in a volume access group so that our hosts can see it.
because one of those two hosts is running the virtual machine that this volume is going to be attached to. So under quick view, let's say attach the disk. I just have the one VM. Let's hit OK. Switching back over to the SolidFire GUI, I'm going to hit refresh for a bit until we see this actually show up in a volume access group. The process typically takes a matter of seconds. There we are. So it's in our volume access group. If we switch back to our CloudStack GUI, we can see here the process of attaching this particular volume to our VM was successful. Now let's switch back to our snapshots view. Take our one and only snapshot under the quick view column. I want to create a template. I'll just provide some simple name, maybe T1, T1 DESC for the description. This is uh, CentOS 5564-bit. I'll make that public and hit the OK button. So in a moment, uh, we will actually have this particular snapshot, its contents, copied to a template on secondary storage, which can be used by VMs that are spun up onto any kind of primary storage in CloudStack. Okay, the process of creating our template has completed. We can see here in the template section, we have a template called T1, which I'll click on. And under the details, we can see the normal details for a CloudStack template. Now let's go ahead under instances and spin up another VM that makes use in this case of the newly created template. So under uh, Instances, Add Instance in the upper right from a template. I'll go over to My Templates, select T1, Next. In this case, I'll just go ahead and click on uh, SolidFire Compute Offering 1. That's um, the one that we used for our previous VM as well. I'll click on Next. And uh, actually, while we're at it, let's select our disk offering. And I'll click on the next button. We're OK with Affinity, Networking. In Review, I'm going to go ahead and put VM-2. And then I'll spin this up. And when this process has completed, we'll take a look at this and uh, investigate some of the details. OK, our VM has been spun up based on that newly created template and we've also added a data disk. Let's take a look and see what happened on the SolidFire system. I'm switching over to the SolidFire GUI. I'll hit the refresh button and scroll way down to the bottom. Now we can see we left off with Vol-2. So what happened in this new process, and I'll highlight this, the name for this particular volume, we created another SolidFire volume, in this case containing our new template, which we downloaded from secondary storage into this highlighted SolidFire volume. Once that process was complete, we went ahead and cloned a new volume here called root-25, and that serves as the root disk for our virtual machine. And then below that, we have a data disk, since we elected in the process of creating this virtual machine to make a data disk, this is our data disk that was created based on our one and only disk offering that we have. As we'd expect, both of these uh, volumes, the data disk and the root disk, as well as the template, are all in the same CloudStack account because all of those volumes are owned by that particular Cloud CloudStack account. And I guess in this case, we're actually looking at SolidFire accounts, but those map directly to CloudStack accounts. And then over here we see the data disk and the root disk are currently in a volume access group. So they are accessible by both of our KVM hosts. Our template volume, as we'd expect at this point, is not in a volume access group. It was temporarily in a volume access group while we copied data down from secondary storage into this volume. And once that process was complete, we took it out of the volume access group and then began the process of cloning that volume into root-25. 
So we've covered quite a bit here. We've covered adding primary storage to CloudStack that's zone-wide and based on the SolidFire storage plugin, spinning up system VMs that make use of that managed storage, spinning up user VMs that make use of it, as well as data disks. Now one thing I'd like to point out before closing out this video, let me switch back over to our CloudStack environment and we can see here under storage, I'm going to switch over to snapshots. So we've just got our one snapshot, and it was a snapshot of root-23. So I'd like at this point to go ahead and shut down the VM that's making use of root-23, actually expunge that VM, which will lead to the destruction of root-23. Now in CloudStack, snapshots can exist without the volume they are a snapshot of. Traditionally, they were more like backups. Now in this case, we are actually using a snapshot of a volume that exists on the SolidFire cluster. In the SolidFire environment, a snapshot cannot exist without its volume that it's a snapshot of. So we'll see how that is transparently handled in this particular example. So let me go and switch over to the Instances tab. Under Quick View, I'm going to go ahead and destroy, selecting Expunge, hit the OK button. And this will shut down our virtual machine. It will go ahead and detach the data disk that was attached to this particular virtual machine. It will then go ahead and destroy the root disk of this virtual machine, which will lead to the destruction of the corresponding volume on the SolidFire cluster. So this process will take uh, a moment. I'll come back when it's done. Okay, the virtual machine has been destroyed and expunged. If I take a look at the storage tab, we no longer see its root disk. We see that vol-1, which was attached to that particular virtual machine, is no longer attached to it. So let's go ahead now and take a look on the SolidFire side and see how this looks. I'll go ahead, I've actually already refreshed this screen, and we can see that vol-1, which I've highlighted, is no longer in a volume access group. And the reason is because vol-1 on the CloudStack side is not attached to any virtual machine. So therefore, it is not in a volume access group on the SolidFire side. Now we can see here that root-23, which was actually destroyed on the CloudStack side, destroyed and expunged, still exists on the SolidFire side. And the reason is because it has a snapshot that's being utilized from CloudStack. So what we can do here, like let's say we're actually done making use of that snapshot, we want to get rid of it. I'll switch over to CloudStack, go over to the snapshots area, then under quick view, delete the snapshot and say yes. So the SolidFire storage plugin will realize while deleting this snapshot that it is associated with a SolidFire volume that corresponds to an expunged CloudStack volume. Therefore, not only will the snapshot be deleted, but the volume it's a snapshot of will be deleted as well. So let's switch over to the SolidFire GUI. We can see in the unrefreshed view that this information is here. That was volume 617 for its ID. Now I hit the refresh. And 617 is gone here. We can see under the deleted column that this particular volume, 617, root-23 with its name, is basically in the trash. So at this point, it is actually um, eligible to be destroyed by the SolidFire um, mechanism that goes through every now and then and destroys uh, deleted volumes which I believe that is customizable in terms of how often it runs and or how old the volumes have to be 
before being deleted. So right here we can see that even though it was deleted, it has this concept of sort of like a trash bin. So if you actually wanted to recover that and then mine some data from it, you could do that. So that concludes the points I wanted to cover for this particular video. Thanks for watching.